Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to be starting our second session here in just a second. But one quick announcement. Uh, we do want to let everyone know there is a glitch in the feed loop platform right now. Uh, so for those of you getting that API alert, it's not supposed to be there. You don't need to click on it or try to fix it at all. Just kind of let it go. Okay, great. Uh, and again, uh, welcome back. At this point, I'd like to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Keaton Lesnick. Uh, Dr. Lesnick is the CEO of Maya Analytica, uh, a National Science Foundation funded company developing real-time analytic software applications and game-based training tools for improved operational decision-making. Uh, Keaton received his PhD at Oregon State University, where his research focused on using data-driven approaches to incorporate microbial community sequencing data into the biological wastewater treatment models. His current work is focused on improving the stability of biological phosphorus removal in collaboration with uh, Clean Water Services, Oregon State University, and the Boz Institute. Dr. Lesnick? Hello, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, very excited to share the, the work that we've been doing around the long range forecasting of biological phosphorus removal stability. Uh, next slide, please. So as, as Brent pointed out, uh, the unexpected disruptions to, to BPR are common. So in these situations, operators are often forced to respond reactively once they see these intermittent upsets and engineers have to diagnose these issues after the, after the event occurs. So we wanna move ideally from a reactive schema to a proactive schema. Uh, next slide, please. And so what that will take is the ability to forecast, diagnose, and mitigate potential future upsets. So to do this, we need to develop models around this. Next slide. And so a number of sites have great process models, great mechanistic models um, that, are, that are great for design, calibration, uh, design and optimization, um, including a number of these, these ASM models. Uh, but for forecasting, they don't do great as they, they require extensive calibrations and tuning. And they're limited to define components in a very complex system. So one example of this is if you have a Tetraspira community, it might not apply to a, a cumulobacter model as far as some of the metabolic ASMs. Uh, but there are different modeling approaches. Next slide, please. So machine learning is another modeling approach. So these models fit to the actual data. So they don't, they don't break down the components within the system, but they're able to incorporate undefined system complexity because of that. They're extremely flexible, um, able to handle a number of different inputs, but they are poorly interpretable. Once again, you, they do not tell you much about the actual components of the system. Uh, next slide, please. And these models are nothing new. You've been hearing a lot about them recently, but they're nothing new. And he, there's a, this is a quote from IBM here that kind of highlights the amount of data that we are generating currently. And this is one reason why you hear more about machine learning in, in addition to the access to computing power uh, that we all have you know, through, through Amazon servers, Google servers, stuff like that. So it's, it's nothing new, but we are seeing a, a lot of uh, new uh, applications coming out of uh, these techniques. Next slide, please. And they're not as technical as they sound. So uh, machine learning is simply a self-learning algorithm that learns model from data. So we've all been exposed to these in the form of linear regression in, in algebra or as you know, the simplest form. Um, and then deep learning is just layers of different machine learning algorithms built on top of each other. Um, and then everyone hears a lot about AI, but that's a very nebulous term that essentially incorporates any system that's intelligent for rules. So you can even do a basic decision tree that green equals go, red equals stop. And that's essentially as, as complex as some AIs are. Okay, next slide, please. But even though the, the concept might be 
be complex, you need to pay attention when you're developing um, machine learning models to each step. So these are, this is highlights the number of steps that are required. And this ensures that actually what you're gonna get out is, is, is good and not just, not just a bad, bad model. So we're gonna go through some of these, but I want to highlight uh, first the defining system and determining the target. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a this is a diagram of CWS's uh, Durham's uh, aeration basin one. So on this, there's two two sensors that I want to draw your attention to, highlighted by the arrows. Um, firstly, there's a orthophosphate sensor following the secondary clarifier, and we tried to actually forecast this with our early models, um, but we're unable to do so beyond a beyond a few days. Um, and so luckily they have another orthophosphate sensor in the aerobic, um, the, the aerobic orthophosphate sensor that they've identified as an early indicator of instability in their system. Next slide, please. So you can see what that looks like here. So this green line is the aerobic OP um, and you can see that, it, that instability occurs on the order of days before the secondary clarifier effluent, um, which you see that red line there. Uh, next slide, please. And aerobic OP is nicely correlated um, to the, the, the chance of an upset, I mean, meaning a, a high level of secondary clarifier effluent. You can see these nice, nice figures, uh, nice clean data on different time, time windows here uh, that, that make it a really good target for our models. Next slide, please. And so what the, the results we're gonna go through here are following a 150 day evaluation period over this past summer. So a little about the data, we have a number of different facility meteorological, uh, some elements of biological data um, over the past couple of years, you can see, see and then um, on some of the, the dates associated with the training and validation data. And that data was split into training, validation and test data. So the training data is what the model fits to. The validation is what how you select the best model. And then the test data is independent from that process to validate to, to evaluate your model to make sure that it's, it's performing well. Um, so that, that period, the test data is between April 29th and September 24th of this year. Um, next slide, please. And just to highlight what I just, just went over, uh, this is to model development diagram. So once again, uh, the training data is used to develop the model and those hyperparameters that you see there are essentially tuning knobs associated with the different algorithms that end up with tweaks to the model. Um, and then you have the a number of models that you, that you, that you pair against the validation, uh, the validation data um, to determine which of those is, is the best. Okay, next slide, please. And then once you have that best model, now we can use it to actually evaluate against the test, the test data, um, to get a good performance. And this is what, we, and this is what we will go, go through here now. Next slide, please. So this will be an animation that will walk through 150 days of forecast. So the the line represents, uh, the dotted line represents the forecast date. Everything to the left represents an input. Um, the red line to the right represents the predicted future, and the blue line represents uh, the observed future. And so, as you can see it going through right, right here, you see a number of misses and a number of good, good predictions. Um, and we'll walk through this individually, each, each segment here in a second. But you can see that big miss there in August. And the green line is a baseline, which represents the, the most recent um, aerobic OP value uh, input. Okay, so we'll go, we'll go ahead and break down pieces of this animation of the 150 days. So next slide, please. So in, in May, you can notice on the right side that there's this observed future that has a sensor that's acting, acting really funny. So you shouldn't see just a, you know, a flat top like that. That probably means that something is, is wrong with your sensor. 
and as, as far as the forecast goes there there that's in the future so it's 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 not uh interrupted by by that poor data quality but as we play through once that sense that poor sensor data becomes part of the insight input on the left side of the of the dotted line you can see that we actually our forecast is poor in predicting a little a relatively minor upset okay so we'll play through that right now so the forecast is is actually pretty pretty well and then now we're now we're putting inputting bad data into the model and we end up missing this this uh this peak right here this instability right there and for all intents and purposes that might be because of the poor data quality it's hard to break that down now but that one thing that we will be looking in in the future okay next slide please and here this is just to show a stable period and the model shows a stable period so we can go ahead and play through this so both the prediction and the and the forecast uh, i mean the the forecast and the observed they're pretty stable through june okay next slide please and then in july we come up against some instability so you can see the very beginnings of that you know that's about 15 days in the future from this current forecast and i'm going to want to walk walk through this so we can go ahead and play this so this is the this is the best the best part of this model so it's able to see able to see this this instability coming up you know on the order of weeks ahead of time and it it pauses right here and you can see as far as the aerobic op there's not even any variation there's no there's no um, instability presented on the input, you know, everything before the forecast date. And it already knows that something over the next two weeks uh, will be coming along. So this is, this is really cool to see. And this is and breaking a part of, of why it's predicting this. You know, there's 107 different parameters um, input in to predict this. Um, will be really fun to, to figure out what's causing that and, and, and develop some, some causes behind that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, should we play through this, please? And so this shows a big miss in August. So you can see the forecast is just not, not on the same level of what is actually observed. So at, when we were seeing this, as modeling this, this was really frustrating um, to see, but in communication with the facility, it turns out there's a reason for that. Next slide, please. So there is really uh, atypical operational incidents uh, that occurred at two dates in August or in around these um, this big upset, and that's that uh, the hypochlorite sump discharged and probably killed a lot of bugs in the in the in the aeration basin. And so these kind of operational incidents that are extremely atypical. The model won't predict. This is not within the realm of, of his, historical events at the facility. And actually, I wouldn't want to include any examples like this in training data because they, it probably won't likely to occur too many times in the future and actually may alter future forecasts. So I'll get into to maintenance of these models in a little bit. Um, but that's a good example of something that it cannot uh, predict and will not be used really as training data. Okay, next slide, please. And this sh this shows uh, a few false positive tails here in after this event in September, perhaps because of of the atypical operational behavior um, before this. So we can go ahead and play through. So you can, you can see for the most part it is stable, um, with a little a couple false tails um, that that figure that maybe upset was coming along. Um, but for the most part, gets it pretty right. Uh, so these models, they do continue to improve in accuracy. Next slide, please. Um, so our our Gen two models uh, that we that we had at the beginning of the year and and, and deployed earlier this year, uh, you can see the accuracy um, was was worse than the baseline. So here, loss is essentially error, which means the lower the better. And you can see the third model, the third generation models that we developed recently in the, about a couple months ago, 
uh, drastically improved on those. And these improvements are from improved algorithm design, data engineering, uh, how they're input into the algorithms and data cleaning. Uh, so there's a number of the things that we can do to continue to improve these models. Next slide, please. And one thing that we wanted to look at is an incorporation of biological data. So something more relevant to the biology outside the operational and environmental uh, inputs that we had. So we did uh, biweekly metagenomic sequencing over a period of time, and we got relative abundance on the genus level from that and input that into our models, but it only improved it uh, 3%. So not significantly from what we had previously. Uh, next slide, please. But we know that metagenomic sequences contained a huge amounts of data, um, and we compressed that on the on, on the order of, of getting that relative abundance on taxonomy, taxonomy, but that removes a lot of information too. So we need to figure out better ways of compressing that data so it can be input into model, but keeping that meaningful information and then hopefully finding correlations between that data and and uh, something connected to actually the stability of, of the process. So there's other biological data sources that we can explore, including 16S sequencing that I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. Um, this is unlikely to be meaningful due because the, the, that, the data you get from that is very similar to how we treated the metagenomic data. So you, you'll get a relative abundance of a different number of species. So that might not be the way to go, but we could do, we we're planning to look at probes for, for marker genes for PAOs and GAOs, and, and perhaps that will lead to better information or directly uh, characterize PHA. But for any of these data, these types of data, we must weigh the time, labor, and cost of collecting them versus the value. How much does the model improve? So that's, that's a big consideration. Next slide, please. And you can also incorporate a number of different new sensors and analyses. So at, at Clean Water Services, they have a respirometer that they've been working with and they've been calculating residual phosphorus uptake that they've used as an early indicator. And can it improve these models? Well, that's to, that's to be seen and that's the area that we will explore. Uh, next slide, please. No matter what we develop out of this though, the, the trust in the tools is critical. So we've just we've discussed accuracy, but consistency and interpretability is also a huge, huge, uh, huge, huge importance as we go forward to developing these tools. Next slide, please. So consistency is the resistance to day-to-day -day variation forecast. Similar, similar, but not exactly the same as the as a common uh, machine learning metric of robustness. Um, but what I want to show you here is the the gener the regeneration two model is in that inlay there, and I want you to watch how the day to day variation changes. So it'll predict a big upset or stability, big upset, stability. And if a user sees this, then they'll register this as noise and discard the model and will not use it as a tool. So our third generation improved on this, but I want you guys to to watch through this uh, here. Okay, go ahead and play through that. So big upset. No, yeah, big, small, big, small. Uh, so a lot of variation uh, in that. So that's that's a problem. So we did work on getting that. Next slide, please. And so beyond consistency, we need to be able to interpret this. this that's how we get the 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 diagnosis and mitigation functions. So we want to move from data fitting to developing structural models that we can actually have testable hypotheses around. And there are ways to do this that we are that we are exploring. Uh, next slide, please. But operationalist operationalizing this is a huge challenge. Like realistically, you need a data science team to actively maintain ensuring abnormal events aren't included and data quality is 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 maintained. So uh, next slide, please. And you have to deliver this information in real time to operators and analysts. Can you play this animation, please? Uh, so this is our dashboard forecast. So this is what the operator is seeing, uh, operator analysts are seeing every day. They'll get a new one um, that will kind of highlight these forecasts. Uh, next slide, please.
And we're working on game-based training around data visualizations so they can run through a number of different scenarios and not just look at line graphs, but have you use shapes and colors to to uh, to to intake that information. Next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Sorry, so we're excited to, to uh, yeah, so regardless of any of these tools, uh, we're gonna find ways to use data um, and that's, these types of tools are coming um, and we're very excited about that to, to use this as an opportunity to explore the future of, of data tools. Thank you. Next slide, please. And I'd like to acknowledge specifically Adrian at Clean Water Services, who's been very instrumental uh, in doing this uh, work with us. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, we'll take some questions. And sorry, sorry, it seems to be lagging a bit right there. I'm not sure what that, that was about. Great. Uh, thanks, Keaton. Appreciate that talk. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left for some Q&A here. Uh, we have had a couple of questions come in. If you have some more, just keep typing them in. Uh, I have a, a, a three questions from Jason Flowers with Murray Smith. First, what variables within your model did you adjust? Were they related to something expected based on theory or just the empirical values the better for the data? So the adjustments to, to the actual models are more related to the algorithm and, and the hyperparameters around that. Um, we did at the before we even started, we did extensive data cleaning around a number of the operational parameters, and we did you know some of that were that there was a lot of uh, noise in. We actually we didn't include those, and it was more data engineering around inclusion of things that make sense to include, and making sure that the data in, the the data was reliable um, from that standpoint. But yeah, I can talk more. Happy to talk more about that. Um, you know, off, offline here about individual variables. Okay. Did you consider looking at ortho P values at the end of the anaerobic zone as a potential correlating factor? Yes, we did. And they did not correlate. Um, They're very quite, quite noisy. Um, and that, that was when we, when we realized we weren't able to, to forecast the secondary effluent that well, um, anaerobic, we looked the anaerobic OP sensor, we looked at as well. Okay. Uh, what was the COD to P ratio at the plant? I'm assuming this is on the influent. Yeah. So I, I couldn't, you know, I'm the, I'm the modeler and I couldn't tell you uh, that uh, we can, I can look that up, but I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know that. Um, and, you know, I can figure that out for you though. Okay. A question from uh, Dr. Coates at University of Idaho. Any preliminary thoughts on translating model results to operational modifications? Yeah, that's kind of the next step. That's where we're trying to get to building those structural models um, to then be able to say, okay, if we tweak this, what will come out? But we don't, we don't want to get there with just, oh, just trust this black box. We want to get there saying, this is the reason why. Um, and I think that's important for trust in, in the tool. Um, so that is, we are actively working on building uh, structural models around that to get to that point, yes. Okay, I think we got time for one more question here. If you did, if your questions weren't answered, you can feel free to um, try to direct chat, uh, Dr. Lesnick. But last question we have time for here um, from Michelle Maganis. Uh, could you incorporate manual addition of maintenance and operational events to either discount or remove the noise data from the events? Could you, could you I'm sorry, could you read that one more time? Sure. Could you incorporate manual addition of maintenance operational tasks or events in order to try to discount or remove noise data that occur around those events? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can you can you can feed in a number of things uh, for for us. We just want to make sure that it's automated so that you're exporting that input data input to to something that we can we can put into the model. But but absolutely could absolutely do that. Okay, great. 
Well, um, I know there's a bunch more questions in here. So if you if you feel like it, you can try to direct uh, chat Dr. Lesnick or uh, shoot him an email with these questions. Um, we also will be having a Q&A session at the very end of the entire uh, uh, the entire summit that you can stay on for and try to ask these questions then. But in the meantime, we're going to take a quick five minute break to switch over to our next speaker, um, Adam Klein. And uh, so don't forget to switch over to the next session on the left hand side uh, within Feedloop. <laughs> 